this case, we need to think how to best use FD and the internal tool to find these points. And of course, another example, just let's say in automotive, like when there is not there is need to improve. Of course, everybody talks about fuel consumption, but much beyond that is also about cooling of the system noise that can be generated. Uh, uh, the comfort, even let's like, say the air conditioning in some kind. So there's a lot of involvement in that. And another point that's not very highlighted that in cars for sense different for airplanes. In, in, in one point airplanes basically you you try to design the best for that. But in, in, in cars, in another way, there's a design target, usually for passenger cars at least. Passenger cars, there is the design target. And so aerodynamic comes to try to improve that design, but not allowed usually to change too much. That changes for sense when you think now not in passenger cars, but in racing cars for sense. So there, there's not necessarily uh, targeting the design necessarily. It's really about the, the efficiency for a given track or a given uh, uh, target. Okay, so some safety examples. Uh, these I uh, just include just a few examples to illustrate from my PhD time in frame too. I was very when I arrived, I was very interested to study a bit more about uh, racing car aerodynamics. In first sense, this is just a gif of a, 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 a race that the engine just blown. So now we'll be able to see a bit of the wake. So uh, the engine was giving kind of a, a smoke tracker. And there's this small, of, not necessarily small, but uh, a core of vortex structures in the rear wing. That for me was, when I was starting to see these features, I found it very interesting. And I'd like to study a bit more of it. Uh, so of course, I didn't have a racing car to test in either winter and time. So what I was doing is basically get a kind of a, a racing car and start to use it. Study it in ZD. That's one of the advantages of ZD that's basically because of the costs, and uh, if you have already knowledge of ZD solvers, uh, there's no kind of limitation in terms of application. Basically, it can simulate the case that you really intended. And in this case, I was trying to, st to study a bit of the wake characteristics, like how the wake evolves, uh, how the wake evolves as it goes downstream. The flow, or the, the position of the cores and the height of it, and is it how it was evolving? So basically, try to, for instance, for this case, get with a second two and I don't know, one week, two weeks, I was able to study a bit more of this uh, effect that usually in the literature they call it the mushroom uh, vortex structure, when they, the car, the diffuser with the real wind, generate this strong work wash that they start to uh, create two coherent vortex in the uh, rear wing uh, ends. And of course, for sense, now in CFD, another advantage is like just changing uh, the boundary condition, for instance. Uh, how would be the flow, for instance, in this case, with if the car is stationary with uh, a strong wind in the car, and how would be the same relative velocity, wind velocity, but including now uh, movement of the floor and rotation of the, the wheels. And here, CFD for sense would be able to show uh, what would be the impact of the, the wake, especially from the wheels. This is a plane just behind the rear wing. How uh, the rotation of the wheels would impact the wake, your rear view, uh, wake. And from that, I started to study a bit of uh, wakes from passenger cars, different passenger cars, and just to study that to actually how all my PhD uh, research. Of course, what I need to highlight from now, more than these uh, sample cases, is CFD indeed can be misled at some points. If you just use that uh, without, uh, let's say, a previous experience to judge the, the results. These results, for say, just coming back, this is a bit qualitative because I could really uh, assess myself the tool by the time properly. 
by programming, uh, getting a, a reference or experimental reference that I could be able to to replicate my CFD and that be able to judge how accurate or how robust simulations would be dealing with that case, with that uh, flow characteristics. In this case, for instance, a strong uh, upwash uh, from the curve. But, but for this case, on the other way, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, the driver model that is a experimental benchmark that had been developed uh, for the last in 2012, and since that, it be, is becoming a experimental benchmark. In this case, for instance, now I'll be able to judge my CFD simulations and check how accurate it would be, and if I really would be able to trust the results that I'm just showing right now. This, for instance, was just when I studied mesh. I think you all have been heard a lot about this mesh sensitivity. But in the end, this is really important uh, because, uh, of course, in one hand, you want to the the computational simulation be as cheaper as possible in terms of computational power and processing. On the other hand, you want to be as accurate and detailed as possible. And for that, you need to increase the number of meshes. So basically, there is a trade-off. Uh, if you have a, a coarser mesh, you have a not very uh, not much resolution in data and potentially the gradient in the flow is not well resolved. In the other, but in that case, the simulation can be very cheap. If you want to improve the quality, improve the so solving the gradients in the flow and more uh, detail, ge geometric details in, in the body, uh, we need to, of course, push to refine this mesh, but uh, because first, as that was a three-dimensional case, it can be the, the computational power required is really start to grow exponentially. If you just refine from a half of the uh, uh, cell element unit. So this was just to highlight present. This was more more experimental uh, references, and this was the total drag that I was trying to to achieve with that in CFD. And this is just to show actually when I was trying to split simulation in, in other parts like per component and, and evaluate per component what was the behavior, what was the sensitivity of the, the aerodynamic loads per component and study where I should refine more and where the resolution was, uh, let's say, was enough for stability. And just to illustrate for instance, from these, that's uh, was a, a cell unit. That's a unit that I've created in one paper just to quantify the, the size of element. But just take the, the numbers as reference, for instance, if you just want to increase the resolution to acquire uh, just the double of the resolution, the, this, this mesh here was almost eight times the number of cells. And that's almost proportional in, time, in, in the gain of uh, Time required to do the processing. So that's kind of a thing that needs to be chosen quite carefully. Try to optimize uh, meshing, but of course, try to study which components more sensitive to to the flow and that really needs more uh, solving resolution. Otherwise, for three D case, it can be really huge. Of course, for two D case, like means or other simplified cases, uh, these. This kind of uh, hardware uh, limitation is not necessarily a issue nowadays. It was maybe five years ago. That would maybe a case would be running two, one, one, two days. Nowadays it can be four hours. For 3D cases, it's more relevant industrially and for research. It still depends. It, it needs to be careful for carefully choose. And this is just also to illustrate. Uh, in that case, that even a relatively coarse mesh can already achieve quite a good uh, correlation or replicate good uh, experimental data. What I'm showing here, these uh, squares, is basically uh, is the distribution of pressure uh, coefficient over the car, but in the upper surface and the lower surface. And here is the blue dots is just showing the uh, CFD results. 
one thing that I want to highlight here is that is, is already answer one of the questions like what should they trust? Should they trust more Wutanios or SEPD? In this case, uh, I have two experimental data uh, showing the, the black ones and the square ones in black. As you can see here, there's a difference between uh, one experimental to the other, and actually it's quite a big difference, uh, especially in this range. So sorry, if I can just confirm uh, with the society, can you see my mouse when I move it? Please, can I just confirm if my mouse is moving? When yes, you... yes, we can, we can see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll use the mouse to show. For instance, in most of the car, there is a really good correlation between wind tunnel tests that they are, are done in different uh, facilities. But in this one here, for instance, there's a difference. The first time when I was doing my CFDA studies, I was taking only this one here, the square ones, to, to validate. And I found a difference here. In that sense, like, because of uh, just a, a not that confident CFD uh, user, maybe just for like, three, three years, uh, I was thinking that my CFD was my, my, my methodology of the, the solver uh, was not really good enough to solve the case. So I spent a lot of time just trying to improve the resolution and also changing the, the schemes of my, my runs approach to be able to improve this, this case. And I, th I thought earlier, I thought that my CFD was wrong. After some, uh, after one year or two years, I found this another experimental data. So I tried to compare with my old ones in this case, and that case was showing exactly what was FD was showing. Like, uh, so there was almost pretty good correlation between these experiments and the FD. So this is just to highlight that sometimes, uh, just be very careful about the source of the experimental. Not necessarily that there is a. a I, I intentional error on it, but in the end, they are experimentals, they are uh, tests. And for some reason, something can be wrong, like for instance, in this case, maybe just the, the pressure tap in this section, for some reason got obstructed, or there's something biasing the, the flow here. That was on the experimental, not necessarily that would be the case of the, of the, the body. Uh, another point for stance, uh, the experimental data, when they tested this car, they included a strut in the, in the car, of course, to hold the car in place. Uh, in order to really use this data, I included in my simulations, of course, uh, not necessarily the same strut because it was not mentioned, but something closer to that at least, to generate the same outcome bias, from the experimental bias on the model. Because although if you even if you believe that even in reading papers there is experimental, they show the car faults, etc. There are experimental constraints that it was necessarily to put the, the bud in place or even the instruments that was a bit uh, obstructing the flow. If you want to do that in CFD, I strongly advise to use this same, try to replicate as much as possible the experimental conditions to really be able to judge uh, uh, both the XFD and experimental data. That's uh, one mistake that I used to do, especially in the beginning of CFD, that I just get, let's say, a car for stance, puts in a large domain, a very clean domain, and expect that to be uh, correlated to experimental data. Just because I saw that in the paper it would say that CD was equal to a specific value. Uh, actually, if, even if it gets the same values, it, it's more likely to be a coincidence than really uh, be a, a robust result. Because just remember, and that's all the point that I want to highlight, even in experimental uh, facilities like wind tunnels, that is a controlled environment, even if you intended to have as, as control and clean uh, free strength as possible. There are some bias from, from experiments, like some some partial structure or even the tools or even the pressure rake. And that 
try to include that as much as possible in the CFD when you want to validate a case, validate your CFD model. After that, of course, uh, in CFD, you don't need to keep the constraints when you need just to, for development. But again, every time that you need to link them, try to overlap the condition as much as possible. And this was just to highlight from the study when I was trying to study on the core of the week from passenger cars, just to highlight from three different overlapping three different cars. Oops. Uh, here you go, let's go. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, here just to illustrate the second results from that. So after uh, analyzing, really try to compare and uh, investigate the, the response, not, of, not only of the meshing, but also the, the models that uh, my runs model was based on, I, I would be able to say that these weeks uh, was a bit more uh, close to reality, or would re represent a bit closer the reality of the cars. Of course, although this is, is, was a run approach, not necessarily an instead state. So for a time average uh, results, this is closer, I would, I would expect to be closer to the reality. Just to state some uh, experimental uh, cases, now some Montano case. So for instance, uh, because there was no high performance car, uh, a benchmark for a high performance car, uh, we talked in terms to try to develop and propose one. And here is just to illustrate uh, partially that. Uh, this was just the fast, uh, fast back model, and this was when you included a key, uh, aerodynamic kit. Doing development. We developed the spoiler, the diffuser, uh, splitter, canards separated, and this is just the entire pack altogether. Uh, so basically, what is doing here, basically, there is automated strut, uh, just to remove the sound, uh, there is automated strut that was changing the height of the car in relation to the uh, moving ground. In that case, basically, uh, we are basically measuring uh, how was the response, the aerodynamic response in drag and lift, or necessarily uh, uh, force. Uh, you know, so of course, the, the moments on that, as it was changing the height. So what is, would be the performance of the car when you change the height? As you can see here, uh, these types of tests is much more quick to be done in an internal than a CFD, for instance. In CFD, basically, of course, could be done in CFD, yes, but you need to, to be using over meshing, uh, sliding meshing, uh, maybe adaptive meshing, and for that, it, it, the processing would be really cost. Take maybe, oh, what would be doing, what it can be done like in, in a couple of minutes in internal would take maybe. Uh, days or even a week in the environment. So that's for sense just to illustrate a difference. Like uh, in one point, CFD has a very flexible in terms of generating uh, a geometry or a condition. Changing the condition is very easy to do in, in, in CFD. On the other hand, changing uh, position, rotation, this is much quicker to be done in internal. And here for sense uh, is just uh, an illustration of aerodynamic loads on this type of tests. Of course, this data is not necessarily just that quick uh, run. It was taking uh, stationary measurements per height just to be sure that we reduce the uh, experimental error on that to improve the confidence interval as you can see some points here. Uh, but again, so it's just to illustrate how sometimes uh, wind tunnel can be more efficient depending on the case. Of course, uh, if you imagine now that you'll be basically, oh, let's change in another geometry of the car. So of course, in, in, it could be easily done in CAD for instance. Then really uh, reshape and uh, remanufacture another one. So here, just to illustrate, like this is like if someone wants to see a bit more of the experimental data of this model, 
is uh, is related to this paper. And also, uh, the CAD that is developed for the CAD and the internal data is already available on the internet. So everybody needs to use for the automotive studies uh, is already available at print repository and you know, is uh, open source. Okay, so now just illustrate another case of experimental, like total pressure rake. Uh, when you see uh, papers, for instance, that show a uh, pressure map like this, these ones. So how it is done? So this is just to illustrate uh, if a, there is a, is a total pressure probe, and in this case we call a rake because there in this, we have 14 of them. And we basically stay stationary for some moment, acquire data, move just a couple of millimeters, acquire data, and keep doing that, and so on. Here I just take the chance to highlight as well, for instance, uh, some tufts that was include, that, that uh, I included in the back of the car, just to see how would be the, the uh, oscillation of the, the wake in the rear surface. This is a classical uh, experimental technique is that that is used in Italy for all types of cases, especially because it's a so simple uh, feature and so useful because, for instance, you just need uh, Instead a bit of separation flow, this can highlight straight away what is the flow condition in a given surface or even the direction of the flow. So this case just illustrates like uh, when it was one position, did the acquisition for 10 seconds, moved to the second position, and it was on seconds. This case is the other side of how. So we got this one hour map rate of the car full time. And because of that, basically uh, we wanted a really high resolution. So it was moved around every uh, 10 meters. And this was uh, the approach of the road. So the rake did one path, raise the height, second path, then raise and third path. In this uh, case, I was trying to create a bit of overlap between uh, pressure probes, especially because I want to. I was a bit concerned about the uh, uh, accuracy and how uh, how would be able to trust the experimental results. In same in the same way that we usually think about. Actually, running experiments is not completely very far away. We need to be very careful uh, what you measure because in the end, you, when in the same, in same moment that you run a simulation and it, it can convert to something, not very difficult to convert, experiment as well, it can give you some results. You just need to be able to judge if they are really useful or they really mean something. So in this case, first stance, for statistical analysis, just overlapping probes to do uh, with the statistical analysis. This is just some samples results that was given for different uh, distance from the car uh, and for four different cars. So here I was basically creating a wake database for automotive. Uh, is it, it, this database is not yet published, but I hope to be able to publish quite soon and also let uh, as an open source in the, uh, for the for the community to be able to expand, especially to be used for safety, for instance, validate cases. Uh, just uh, a sample of how actually our dynamic kit can change the performance of a car. This is just the wake, just a bit, a one third behind the car. This is from the fastback, and this is from a, a what we call the high performance fastback. Now what you see here is the total pressure pro, uh, total pressure coefficient from one and decreasing. So you can see that the the flow energy, the loss in the flow, the, the loss from from the weight in a racing car, for instance, is much higher, especially because of the intense uh, uh, turbulence that it generates, and also about this feature like the the large amount that the diffuser and usually spoiler generates is strong upwash, and this basically generates a lot of uh, turbulence. All this turbulence is, is dissipated and is all best lost in heat. 
So that was all energy of the flow. That was uh, moment uh, energy in terms of momentum. It's converted in uh, thermal energy or internal energy. Okay, so I'm just talking a bit now about experimental significance. So that was just some samples of uh, experiments. Now, how uh, we need to, how much should we trust in experiments? Uh, well, for, for all of you, if you don't uh, never uh, met this facility, this is the Cranfield uh, 8x6 link signal. Uh, in here, we have a, a stationary floor, uh, the boundary layer intake. And this was the total pressure rake that was installed to, to move this rake here and measure the max pressure. Okay, so first about uh, the bias of the facility. Uh, in this facility, for instance, uh, not only this facility, but in terms in general, because of any uh, wall will grow boundary layer from it. In, for for especially for automotive case that is quite crucial in the floor because uh, in real life the, the road is always in movement in relation to the body and if you think like uh, is the car moving uh, so is the, is the air and the road is stationary if you take the reference of the car is the the the, the flow moving in reference to the car as well as the road. So the road and the flows in, in, in place. So to, to remove this uh, boundary layer from the ground and to try to replicate as much as possible these uh, relative, at least to improve these stationary floor here to closer to a, a, a real case, uh, autom uh, automotive uh, internals usually apply boundary layer intakes. In internal, in, in graphic, for instance, we have two stages. First one that removes most of the uh, boundary layer that was grown in the contraction. And just ahead of the, the car position, there is a second one that removes the, the remaining boundary layer that had been growing from this distance. So, so from here on, there is a bit of boundary layer growth, but it's not necessarily uh, that much in the position of the car. So first thing, so it, the stationary floor can be a manageable bias, but still is a bias in, in, in the case that you want to study. If you compare for strategy for strength, if you just impose a movement of the flow. So this would be two different uh, propositions. And this is just to highlight uh, the difference of if you turn on and turn off the boundary layer intake. This is mapping the total pressure loss in the, in the position of the acquisition in relation to these uh, these tools, these boundary intakes. So the first one is one you take uh, both on, so you minimize the boundary layer growth. If you don't, if you just turn on uh, the second one, the first one, the, there is a bit of a, is is a quite a larger, and if you turn off both. Is really um, a bit unstable and even larger. So that's just to illustrate why it's quite important to use boundary layer intake. Not to remove totally the boundary layer in the floor, but at least to minimize it. So, of course, so if they are on they are like roughly 40 millimeters, here maybe this would be like 15 to 20 millimeters. Uh, so about resolution, for instance, uh, this is the same case, but if you move, uh, if you change the resolution of these lateral movements of the array. So as you can see, if you increase resolution, you acquire better the gradients of the pressure gradients. And as soon as you try to increase the distance between them, you start to be, you become a bit more, uh, of course, uh, coarse, uh, interpolated destination. If you compare them, they are not that critical. It's just a matter of in case that you know that there are high gradients or there's a specific feature that you want to study. So you need to pay attention from that. And that's, of course, things that usually people doesn't show much in experimental uh, data, published data. But so here, I just would like to highlight from experimental, there are also these 
bias, for instance, when you, even in terms of the resolution of the instruments, like, uh, so this can also impact the, what is the outcome. Uh, this is just to compare as well uh, the, the confidence interval of a specific case. So the, in this car, one specific plane was repeating the same case just to compare how robust was the measurement. And here in the GIF, you can see how there is an inner change. Not very critical, but still minor changes. What I was applying here is a concept, well, I was basically blocking this idea of a uh, spatial confidence interval. So um, I was not necessarily uh, interested only in one probe, what is the confidence interval of the one probe, but how that confidence interval will be changing in space in, in, in relation to the wake. So for in here, that's out of the wake, let's say more undisturbed flow, uh, the, the, the total pressure uh, coefficient that is only fluctuating in terms of 1%, not much. When we start to acquire in the weight, start to be a bit more fluctuating. Could be even in terms of five five percent, with a small peak of around eight percent. But at least, so we can estimate that the entire uh, mapping is not necessarily right. The entire map in the region of uh, low disturbance is maybe the acquisition is right by one or two percent. Inside the wake, it can be increased by between a fluctuation of 3%. And a, a single point, if you're interested in a single point, it could be a, a, a peak that could be even higher than that, like 7%. But of course, this peak would be fluctuating depending on the case. And here is just to illustrate uh, the overlap that was done. So by the overlap, I was able to measure when I was getting from one probe and when the rate move up. So different probes getting the same region, what was the difference? They normally should be the same because of the same position. But uh, again, as I can highlight here, experimental uh, measurements have uh, not, not necessarily a bias, but uh, uncertainty. That can happen. It can be a systematical uh, error or even uh, random. In this case, we could see that there are some ranges, some position that was a systematic error more than really a random error, as can be illustrated here. Uh, another point as well. Uh, I was cha uh, changing the free stream, try to change to measure different free streams. In experimental, in experimental case, for instance. Uh, Pressure for total pressure rate, higher speeds ha had a higher uh, signal to noise ratio. And when I was reducing the, the free stream, as well, would be reducing the dynamic pressure quadratically, and the signal to, the, to, to noise was reducing. That means uh, when I was trying to, to change from uh, 40 meters per second to 20 meters per second, there's so much, much more noise in the data that's uh, being higher free stream. And that's the thing for sense, if you do this FP, you don't even think about it. You just reduce one parameter and run again, and this is it. For experimental, you need to keep it, you need to be, uh, you need to keep attention from that, maybe just to use some, uh, Another tricks in, in the instruments uh, from the electronics just to improve the signal to be able to really judge and acquire that a bit better. Uh, for instance, here uh, I was just wondering uh, why the experimental the experiment was giving a bit of uh, asymmetrical, even though the car, all of the car was assumed symmetrical by manufacturing. Uh, and when he did change the angles, uh, your angles of the car, we saw that the symmetrical one would be between zero and one degree. So that was basically a change between the nominal and experiments. And we found that it would be about 0 0.7. I'm going to do a, a bit more comments in the end, because uh, I just would like why to have the use for that. Uh, so, okay, so I was basically talking about total pressure, how maps can be done. 
now I want to show uh, maps of velocity. Uh, that's kind of a trend in experimental publications, and of course, very useful as well. Uh, just want to, to illustrate how it works. Uh, of course, just because, just uh, give a summary. Uh, what you see for here for stance is just uh, a grid, not scalar anymore as was total pressure, but now is a vector field. So from we have a grid, like in a meshing for stance, just do association, and in, in that meshing in space we have a, a vector distribution of lost. And that can be done experimentally as well. Uh, so this is how it works, uh, PIV. It's, it's called particle image flow symmetry because it's really uh, taking images of the flow and in the particles of, of it and try to estimate how is it displacement in time. So basically, a camera will take two pictures very fast just to see, for instance, and after uh, split this image in very small blocks, and try to see how would be the displacement of a couple of particles in that space. Of course, just getting these two for sense, this group of particles here moved from this position to this position. So from that, it tried to correlate what's supposed to be the direction of the, the movement. It's not tracking a particle specifically, but it tried to, to, to estimate what's the uh, displacement of a, a pack of a parcel of particles in that image. So basically this resolution is what is the size of the of the uh, this window, the, the window that's the, the window of analysis. So let's imagine that you have an entire image, it's split in, in many windows, and from that window you say what's the resolution. For that window it's going to find one lost vector as this one. So just to Roughly uh, illustrate how it uh, is the idea of the idea. Not, is, not track a particle, but in a given part of an image, try to, est to estimate and correlate the direction of a displacement. Uh, so, PIV to, to be done in retinals have uh, some fundamental, very crucial uh, fundamentals to, to be covered up. First is really the seeding, what we call the seeding. It's basically the particles we call the seeds of the flow, and that's what is going to measure. So basically, you need to have uh, a, a seeding generator. In internal first tense, can be usually a smoke machine. In water plumes, can be uh, particles of glasses. And they are very, very small. I'm going to highlight that later. Uh, light. Of course, image acquisition cameras and the calibration for that to convert what's supposed to be a uh, image or pixel displacement in space. Okay, so about seeding. It's really about the injection of particles in the flow in the, in the internal uh, to be, so we can be uh, track the flow movement by this seeding. That, of course, is very important for this part to be really, really small. And that's we try to minimize this total number as much as possible. So in that sense, the particle uh, has very little inertia in the flow. When the flow really find, has a, a gradient or a vortex structure, the particle doesn't really try to go tangentially, but it really is be dragged by the flow. And of course, uh, when you improve the uh, we reduce the, the particle, we can improve the resolution. So if the particle is really, really small, we can get just a parcel of five to 10 particles in a very tiny uh, image window. In that sense, we increase the number of vectors in the image. So uh, the lighting source. So we have the, the internal running, it has seeding. Uh, so now we basically have, uh, well, we need to have a proper uh, light source. A light that will be uh, highlighting, showing the particles, uh, the, the movement of the particles. For general PIV, uh, usually the laser is uh, in phase with the camera. So when the cameras uh, trigger uh, acquisition, it uh, automatically the same signal uh, fires the, the laser to give one pulse, and the camera do the acquisition, and it can be really fast. Uh, 
it can be not necessarily that it really requires a dark background. Sometimes it's necessary to do it with some lights or in other experiments. But if it's dark environment, we, we have more control about the light source. And you know specifically, in the case of lasers, even the frequency, the light, uh, the color in the wavelength of, the, of that laser. So we can control better and also uh, cross-process it better. Uh, of course, just one thing that I need to highlight, this kind of lasers can be really harmful. Uh, lasers can be classified between class one to four. Usually for PIV is between three to four. And that class can really uh, can blind someone or even cause uh, skin damage. So this type of experiments can, must be done very, very carefully. Uh, in Cranfield, by, by the time when I did it, uh, this is just uh, one laser generator, the laser cooling, and it has the armed optics. So this optics was basically transferring the laser beam that was leading the laser head, and the optics would be able to move with uh, mirrors uh, re to reflect the beam along these tubes for a, a position of interest. Of course, not, not always that's the case. Uh, in many cases, when I need to use, especially with our phantom, uh, we use much uh, more actually just uh, mirrors. So we have a, a gener laser generation that fires a laser and we reflect it with mirrors until a, po a, a position of interest. And from that, uh, we expand the laser beam into a planar beam. Uh, so we use cylindrical lenses that can expand just in one direction and create a plane of that beam. And that's so generate the plane where it would be doing the measurements. Uh, this, uh, I just would like to highlight another case that uh, can be quite complicated to do. When you uh, need to eliminate both sides of a body with the same source of a laser. So for instance, here, uh, there was the laser uh, source. Uh, so one beam would be going uh, up, reflected here, and here expanded, and maybe create one planner, but you want to do the same the other side. So we use it here, uh, a laser splitter. So it was splitting the laser into one, sending to this mirror and expanded from one side, and the other was keeping straight, reflecting, like in these tubes here, and up from the other side of the facility and expanding from the other side. So in this case, we're using uh, splitting the mirror, splitting the laser and also mirrors to reflection. So in that case, we'll be able to eliminate uh, the wing from both sides and get data. The camera in this case was underneath the wing, measuring from both sides. Uh, cameras. Uh, so very important uh, for PIV is the image acquisition. If, the, if there is only interest to measure uh, a, a planar uh, one uh, section, planar section of data, and there is no need for uh, three components of velocity. For instance, if you just want to uh, measure uh, this the stall of a wing, for instance, just in a planar sense, without measuring the spun-wise direction. It can be done just with one camera in a 2D uh, mapping. However, if you want the three components of velocity, you really must have more than one camera to really be able to measure the depth. One camera can measure the, the, the displacement normal to, to the camera, but not the depth. So, a second camera would be able to be correlated and measure that. So there's many configurations. One is called the stereo. When you use two cameras, in stereo condition. Uh, so this is just to illustrate the, uh, the case, the camera and the laser beam and generation, a body, in this case, a wing, and acquisition. In this other case, just illustrating the car for sense, it was, it, when I did, I, I required to know what was the free string direction, the depth direction. So for that case, 
at three components, and so two cameras, stereo configuration. Uh, calibration. Uh, so basically, you have the CD, you have the light, the cameras acquired the data. So what data we have? The cameras only can the post-processing with that image is only is going to show the displacement in terms of pixels, or how the particles changing from one area of the image to the other. So with calibration is, is quite a simple but crucial because that's how we're going to convert the uh, the information in terms of pixels of the of the image to a spatial position. So as I was mentioned, for uh, stereo configuration, we need to measure three D. You need to small this small information in terms of that. So this was just to uh, to illustrate uh, the the area of acquisition was exactly this calibration board, and the calibration was positioned exactly in the laser uh, uh, position. Uh, so here is how each camera was seen the the board. So as you can see, there is a bit of uh, perspective effect. One camera will seem uh, larger from one side, and the other, of course, the other way around. The correlation, the software usually try to uh, create a, a correction of this image. They try to dis create a distortion of it for each camera. So basically, there is one correlation uh, uh, equation for each camera to convert this uh, perspective image to a planner, what's supposed to be the planner view. And from that, they able to compare uh, both cameras and spaces. Uh, so here is just to uh, summarize. So PIV uh, is an image-based technique that's able to estimate velocity by measuring particle displacement. It can be done basically uh, a planner one, just what a single camera can do. Uh, stereo PV, so when you need to, to measure with multiple cameras. And a Tomo PV that I, I didn't mention yet, is when you do, okay, it can be similar to stereo, but stereo usually is for a planner, uh, a planner, three components velocity. Tomo can, is for measure in space, so you measure now a PV in volume. So in same sense as you do the stereo, but now in volume. So in that case, uh, usually it requires uh, four cameras to, to better uh, estimate because the number of particles now in, in a plane, that one point that I didn't highlight. Uh, usually PV, because of laser, the thickness that you measure is around two millimeter, uh, two, even maybe even three millimeter thick uh, plane. That's, especially now in this in this case, is when the, flow, the, the particle was crossing the plane. When you're doing Tomo PIV, basically measuring space, there's much more particles that's going to be highlighted. So that's why you need a bit more cameras than four cameras, for instance. Just to be sure that you're measuring uh, the, the same particles, it, not overlapping particles. Uh, of course, the, uh, there's a lot of issues that can happen uh, with PIV, for instance, in the, in the same sense that I was showing before of the uh, when I was splitting the laser beam. So basically I have one source and that source was generating a minor uh, shadow on the other side. And the second source, a minor shadow in the, in the other way around. And a thing that I didn't comment, but I can show here is when these lasers hit the body, that can be a, a big problem because it generates a larger re reflection in the camera. So all the particles around that uh, reflection is basically lost. There's no way to really uh, estimate the displacement anymore. Uh, it can happen even like say, uh, not necessarily even the laser heat the body, but when it uh, reflects in the body, it creates kind of a background noise. Uh, okay, so now it's just to expand a bit the comments about experimentals and about the DAC, digital image correlation. Uh, this is what I want to highlight is not necessarily uh, uh, experiment doing by the flow, but for instance, when you need to do a bit of elasticity. Uh, in this in this setup, I have a wing that was set in my sliders and it's going, it's going to be moving around. 
Then I have two cameras in a stereo configuration, seeing this, uh, this ring. And a third one inside the wind tunnel, you get a, a frontal view of the wing. What this type of experience can do uh, is like this. So the wing is moving. Uh, and this is what this type of approach can do. It's, it can basically uh, track the, the displacement of the, the body in similar way, and, uh, roughly closer to PIV, but now of course in structure and really tracking that how the image of the, the wing is moving in space and try to estimate the displacement. Of course, with very different things, PIV uh, tracking uh, displacement of particles, a group of particles. This is tracking uh, how the image is this this distortion of an uh, image in space. Uh, so just to highlight uh, this type of oscillation and how the, the outcome from, from spreads. First, uh, in this case, uh, uh, this could be, uh, just to illustrate a case, uh, experimental uh, reference for safety when you need to, to start the aerodynamic uh, elasticity. So, of course, to do that in CFD is much more complex when you need to deal with moving bodies like this, especially when the movement is dynamic, when it's driving by the flow, especially in that case. But uh, it soon is, is going to be much more uh, feasible in CFD uh, as we try to increase a bit further the hardware, and especially the modeling. This is another case uh, when you have a flexible that was a rigid wing, and this is a flexible wing moving uh, in the wind tunnel, but driving by the flow, and how this experimental technique can behave and acquire data from that. And for a sense, in the, we have the wind tunnel, we got the data, we have experiments. From experimental, now we'd be able to explore that for CFT, develop uh, safety methodologies uh, and approaches for that improve the, the designs and bring back to the Nintendo to just to validate the solutions that can be found explored since FD just to validate the Nintendo. Uh, and one of the last ones that I wanted to comment is about particle particle tracking closing to uh, PTV. Uh, this is this one is really indeed about particle tracking. Uh, PID, was about correlation of the image of a parcel of, uh, of particles, and this one is really tracking per particle. So this was the uh, the particles uh, going around a wing. In, the, in this case, it was actually a water plume, a water tank, uh, and you have a lot of particles. This is how there is a bit of pre-processing of the image for uh, this type of analysis. So we pre-process the image for experiments be able to uh, reduce the noise of uh, some particles, let's say this feature, for instance, that was just a background surface of the water, the free surface of the water that was generated some uh, oscillations, partially can be improved in, in, in pre-processing image for uh, try to extract, extract data. And this is a bit of the results for ANAC uh, 12 of uh, PTV by, by the call shake the box uh, approach. So in this case, is really a experimental data, a tree of a volume tracking particles. That was actually quite impressive and is one of the uh, state of arts in experimental techniques. Uh, when you, you be able to measure uh, a volume of, of the wing, you really be able to track particles of it and basically extract data that's likely to be uh, like a CFD data, but it's really experimental one. And acquired the acquisition is really quick after, of course, after the setup is done. Acquisitions can be really quick in a couple of minutes, cross processing maybe uh, a couple of hours to days. But uh, this is it. So it can be really quick and effective. Of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
modeling to, to extract this data. So somehow it's not very different from safety, for instance, when you need to have the data, but depending on the, the, the modeling that you apply, you can get different data from it. So it's just to show how actually CFD and uh, Wintunnel is actually converging in some aspects. Uh, so they're, they're really getting closer to each other. Uh, and in terms of when you talk about overlapping them, one approach that I try to, to keep is when I need to do CFD, try to get the experimental domain of my reference as much as possible, as I was highlighting in the beginning of a car. So, uh, if I know that the experiment was done in one specific city, this, for instance, just to illustrate the internet that we have in Southampton, is 11 by 80 feet, uh, which of internal. Uh, what I did is basically I, I created the CAD of the, the facility, at least the test section. To when I do experiments in this facility, I will try to, and I need to analyze in CFD, I will include this uh, domain and simulate as it was in the internal, just to be sure that any experimental bias that I may have in the experiment, I'm including in the CFD when I need to do reference or validation on CFD. Only after that, if I need to explain the analysis, I'm free to explore more conditions. And this is just to illustrate uh, one link, uh, a, a pilot uh, test that I was considering to do in the Micho when it would be doing the experiments of a link, similar to what I just showed um, with the DC in the internal. And in this case, it's actually the CFD domain. I uh, included the CFD domain and I simulated what would be the wing, how it would behave in, in these environments. What I was concerned is actually what, what was the uh, experimental bias that the base would give to the wing, uh, the, well, to the load distribution in the fuel. Uh, one thing that's just to straight one case that I'm working with now, uh, I'm planning to do uh, the shake the box, that particle tracking. We're going to do again in that moving wing, but I need to include the rate that generated the, 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 the particles in the, the, in the in the test section. So before even I do the experiment, uh, that I know that basically this type of data I only can get by experiment because the complexity of the, the, the body move, the geometry and the moving body, uh, I'm, all, I'm at least able to do a preliminary safety test to try to give me guidance. How would be the, the, the condition of the flow for a given uh, position of the rake, free stream and end of attack? So I can optimize the position of the rake to the region where I want to do my experimental acquisition. And from the, when once I know the area where I want to do my experimental position, do the entire hardware setup, the cameras, the rig, the CDs, and be able to, to do the experiment, to improve the experiment. Uh, another point, as I was commenting before, for instance, when I saw the experiment, there was a bit of uh, asymmetry in experiments. There were some researchers that would say that is a bit of asymmetry of the way. And that's true, I agree that wakes, especially for both the scars, is never symmetrical. There is, there is a time phase from it. But at least in terms of a time average, it was supposed to be closer to the symmetrical one in, in terms of long, long time average. But I was finding a bit of asymmetry. Uh, by the experimental data, I was estimating that it's to be between zero and one. So what I did is basically get the the car condition, the, uh, the CAD of the internal, and I simulated everything again in CFD and changing a bit, a tiny bit the angle of attack of the car, the yaw angle of the car. And by CFD, I was estimating that uh, when I was doing a case 0 0.7 in CFD, it was the closest to the internal. So in this case, for instance, using CFD, I would be able to judge my own experimental data and show that uh, there was a systematic error in the angle, in the nominal angle, your angle of the, the case by 0 0.7 degree. So just to illustrate how actually CFD and internals can also help each other uh, to really study the case, that in the end, my, my goal was to study the wakes of uh, cars. So using one tool that was internals, and now, now using safety also to, to judge it. And 
in this case, it's just to show that neither of them is really perfect. Like in internal cases can can have a bit of systemic bias, like for instance, mispositioning the car by a, a tiny angle. Uh, but also CFD, for instance, uh, the the modeling. If I want to improve to improve much more the modeling, the co the computational cost could be reaching weeks of simulation. And for sense, so you can see the difference between uh, how the wake of the mirror is showing the SFD in a bit of experimental. But at least we know that when comparing them, you know that this, the real case is supposed to be between them, not one of them, but between them. When you know that you know how the experimental is on and how the SFD is on. In the last one well, to comment, for instance, when you use uh, your overlap CFD and internal to improve even the, the internal, for instance. Uh, when you want to, to improve the experimental facility. This was when I replicated the, the total pressure rake, the experiment that was done in CFD, using exactly the same geometry of the rake. And by that time, I, I found one thing that was not commented by that time, that the rake actually was producing a lot. The rake, the total pressure was producing, the but was producing a lot of weight. It was could be a bit biasing a bit the the measurements. So uh, by CFD, I was trying to study if there was a way to change geometry just a tiny bit, just including a bit of body like some fairings, and if it, it was able to reduce the bias or even improve the the performance of the material. And this is just. In that case, when I include this new geometry, uh, when I propose this change to the geometry, if you just include some fairings in, in the, the rake, it will reduce drastically the, the amount of drag that was requiring, and also reducing the bias that is be given in the wake of the body of the study. This is not only about measuring uh, the wake, but when I was comparing, it could be improving the uh, uh, saving the energy cost of the internal by 5% just by uh, using the fairing here to reduce the, the drag of the, of the weight. So it's not only about improving the, the quality of the data, but even saving some uh, bills in electricity. Uh, so this was just a, a few comments about CFD and experiments. Uh, try, I'm trying to highlight uh, actually the quality of them, uh, give a bit more feedback about the experiments from the experience that I have. And try to show some cases that they can overlap a bit and how they can work together. Uh, the last message that I want to highlight is uh, so CFD or internal. Uh, so actually, if you can, both of them are the greatest. When you can combine CFD with internal, it's, that's when you really start to get closer to the real case or the solution that you intended. CFD can be cheaper, but can be misleaded some, sometimes in terms of modeling if you don't have much reference. And that's how experiments can, can get in. Experiments can get good reference, especially because you can uh, 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 analyze the certainty of that case. And there are some specific cases that the internet is much more efficient in doing that like when you need to move the body or some specific case. That, so interns can be even more efficient than CFD in others. But when you can combine them and analyze Wind tunnel with CFD and CFD with wind tunnel is the when you really have a great tool for that. So that's how I want to end the, the talk, and I'm open to, to any questions. So thank you very much for you all. I hope it has helped. Thank you very much, Renan, for this very interesting presentation. I think you highlighted pretty good the, the advantages and limitations of both CFD and the wind tunnel especially the, the complexity of a wind tunnel setup, because, for example, in my case, I'm a CFD guy, and I really get the, the, the wind tunnel experiment, just the set of data as a validation, so I don't really care about how, how to set up. So it's, it's very complex, it was very interesting from my side. Again, so it's also very interesting the way, the way you explain to combine both results in order to extract the maximum information. So now let's proceed to the questions and answer session. So a colleague from the society, Luca, will proceed to, to ask the questions that have been posted in the chat. Uh, again, if you have still not posted the questions and you want to, you still have some time. Luca will select the questions and, they, and he will read it. So Luca, it's all yours. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Yeah, th th thank you, Renan. 
really that, that was really interesting and thank you the, to the audience for the engagement as well um yeah no that i think it was as Giuseppe pointed out was really interesting even uh, as you highlighted the all possible all sources of uncertainty that you actually have also in a wind tunnel and it's something that we should all take into account and i'm also a safety guy as Giuseppe and so sometimes we we forget about it uh we we just go uh, went into our CFD and put the, the, the results in the same plot, but actually uh, we should all uh, try to ensure that we are uh, within the uncertainty range. Um, we have a few questions from the chat. Um, so one of the guy is asking, how do you actually ensure, so moving to CFD, how do you actually ensure that the flow has similar condition as those in the in the wind tunnel? I guess in uh, when you are playing CFD, is it? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that's actually a quite important question. Uh, so, sorry, can you just rephrase the the question? If, because it can be can mean multiple things. How can you uh, reapply the the free stream from experimental in CFD? Is it or the quality? Because they are different things. So I can just repeat the question. So a bit. I think Luca is probably probably muted without being aware of it. So okay. So okay. yeah, is the is the the first question you 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 post? I think is uh, so. Yes. How would you just ensure that the CFD is representative enough of the conditions of the wind tunnel? Okay. In terms okay. of boundary conditions, I guess. Yeah, so that's quite an uh, quite important question. Indeed. I'll try to give the the, the, the broad uh, answer because uh, there's multiple questions actually inside this one. The first is uh, you 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 have a, you have an experimental reference, so you know someone who did or even you self did experiments, and you want to study that in CFD. The, of course, the first question is, is to do in CFD uh, is how. Uh, how was the boundary conditions of the experiments? How was the bias in the free stream flow in the experiments? In that sense, it's not, of course, it's much more than just uh, the free stream magnitude, but also the turbulence of the free stream, uh, the uh, uniformity of the free stream, um, the boundary condition uh, of the, the intake of the free stream. So that's, let's say, it's just small parts of it that can be included in CFD. And that's how actually, for me, I find very important to include the blockage of the CFD, the experimental, the wind tunnel walls in the CFD, because automatically I'm going to replicate the boundary layer growth from the walls and the bias that is going to represent in the flow. But not only by the, the blockage, but also about the energy loss that is accumulated from the boundary layer. Uh, another, and in that also helps if included the, I'm going just to share my screen again. Uh, I'm just going back some slides. Of course, when I include this simulation, actually I include my inlet here even before the contraction, because I want my flow in the inlet of the intern here to already include a bit of uniformity that may happen because of the contraction and inner minor uh, boundary layer that start to grow already from the contraction. So that's actually what I found very important to simulate even before that. Just to be sure to, to get the maximum flow closer as possible without much cost in set B, because here, your uh, meshing can be much coarser. There's no need because it's a very undisturbed flow. It's just, you just need to refine it properly in the boundary layer. Uh, but even beyond that, even beyond the safety side, we need to ask again about the experimental side. How we ensure that the free stream was exactly that condition? How we ensure that the, the free stream uh, was in that specific magnitude? Uh, if the turbulence intensity had been uh, uh, evaluated, have been uh, analyzed, because even if you, it may happen, like because it's all about instruments. Even if you believe that you run in the internal at 40 meters per second, for instance, uh, if there is any problem, if the transducers or 
anything else, it can be giving a false value for that. Another point, one thing that you don't care much about in CFD, but we need to care a lot in experiments, that even humidity can change the density of the air. So even if you're doing uh, experimental in one day, in the other day, it start to rain, for instance. If the air that he is the winter exposed is easily exchanged with the uh, outer out of the building, it can be bringing more uh, humid air that's a bit more dense. If you change the density, you're going to change the what you, your estimation of velocity. Because in internal, we don't measure velocity. We, we, what we measure is the dynamic uh, dynamic pressure of the fuel stream. But then pressure, we need to know the density to know the velocity. Of course, there's cal uh, correlations and calibrations that's done, but that's how we need to really pay, need to pay attention to the temperature density of the facility to be able to estimate properly the density and from that calculate the velocity. Uh, so I hope I have covered the, the question yeah, 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 no, th th thanks a lot for the really uh, uh, for the explanation that was really exhaustive. Uh, we have um, another question actually, which is related to this one. Uh, a guy is asking, uh, how do you see the future role of wind tunnels if we shift towards real environmental testing? Uh, for example, including weather condition, uh, so turbulence, gas, precipitation, uh, particle deposition. Um, can you yeah. please comment on that? Yeah, actually there, there's a little, um, yeah, there, there is this intention to expand, of course, the what these internals can do. Uh, and, and just to show actually what uh, check the box, particle tracking is, uh, it's really expanding what was done in, in experimenters. If you think like maybe 20 years ago, uh, what we could be able to achieve with internals based only measuring loads or total pr or pressure. With, with PIV, we start to measure velocity uh, mapping with image. With now particle tracking, start to measure really particle tracking indeed, so tracking in, in volume. Uh, and there's also internals try, try, try to invest now in, in try to create, let's say, I think in Germany, uh, they create a rake of uh, wings that basically moving, moving and create disturbance. So you can emulate uh, gusts like uh, gusts like wind, wind gusts like a fluctuation, a turbulence from the wind for an out applications. Uh, for automotive, as I think, uh, uh, as I have been highlighted by Jaguar presentations. Uh, the soil deposition, so you can include contaminants or generation of smoke to really study where uh, particles can be accumulated over a car for stance. So yeah, there, there is range to be improved uh, in terms. The only problem that this space of the intern is, is I think that can be not changed. But apart from that, uh, what instrument you can bring, yeah, it's basically up to development. Yeah, no, th thanks again. Uh, a more, more general question. Uh, so we know that, for example, CFD is very useful uh, for preliminary design phase, no? when you actually you are actually designing something new. When, how, do, so how do we know actually when it's the right time to move to wind tunnel experiment? I mean, is it, is it just about cost or do you need uh, enough information that so that you can actually perform your experiment and being uh, aware of the the condition and what's going on, uh, so uh, so that you are actually able to model it. Well, uh, that can be, can vary the, the answer because it's all about app the application, the application and the well, what what you want to solve, right? Because it depends, like if it's for research purpose or for industrial purpose, even if let's take like in the industry, for instance, let's say aeronautics, and maybe automotive applications, uh, there is no need actually for them to, to achieve the maximum reduction in drag or even aircrafts. Uh, no, aircrafts, yes, they need to improve the fuel efficiency, but uh, 
it's not paramount to find the minimum uh, or maximize the lift to drag ratio ever. Then you just need to, to do as much as possible giving uh, for a given cost what they can afford. And also the, the time frame. Uh, for Renox, uh, the development of aircraft is usually the cycle can be a decade. For a car, the cycle of development is like four years. So it depends a lot of the application. Uh, of course, for business like automotive applications, it's much cheaper, especially because they have like a long history. Uh, they have already experimental data of previous cars. So it's much simpler just to take that experimental data that from the previous case, uh, study from CFD, develop models, the, do, do most of the development uh, in CFD, uh, do an experiment just to validate in the, in the middle way to see if the, the direction that CFD is going, is, is it uh, correlated to reality? If the CFD and, and intern have a good correlation, you just expand the CFD even further to, to maximize it, even to, to give more trust. And only in the end, the very end, they would be doing uh, wind tunnel again, just to ensure that the what they are going to, the final outcome is really uh, effective. And of course, to, to study what cannot be done by safety, or at least not can be done quickly or easily. So let's say, let's say uh, moving the car or these other types of, uh, Genetic changes, for instance, that can not be done very quick in CFD. Just to take the chance, because in the internal, well, it's just pay per hour, so just maximize the time. So it depends a lot, it depends on the application. For, for research, of course, it can be different because uh, we try to research to focus on quality the data. So uh, it usually can can be even more can can be uh, internal and safety really simultaneously going together just to be sure that we expand each other to what you see in internal if you can uh, understand better in safety and safety give back to internal but the industry tends to go of course more to safety because for the for the costs mostly because of the costs is it can be a cheaper solution but it cannot but it cannot override Wintanio totally because uh, there are things that Wintanio can do better and quicker, more efficiently, and also can even uh, assess the safety too. So that's the, the good answer. It depends, depending on the application. Yeah, no, th thanks. Uh, I, I strongly agree with you. I mean, it's really a, a feedback mechanism, but at the end, yeah, it really depends on the application and the, the amount of money that you have available. Uh, so I guess from the audience is everything. So I will pass by the word to uh, to to Giuseppe. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Luca, and well, thanks, Renan, of course. So well, usually after the talk, we give a little award, a little award, a little memento to the speakers from the society for obvious reasons. This time, this is not possible, but. Well, uh, we would we will invite you as a as an honorific guest to the next talk to be held in Clamfield or well physically, and then we will we will reward you the the, the speech there if you, if you agree, of course. So apart from that, just to well to thank everybody for for attending the event, uh, we will try to continue organizing these events even if if they have to be online. Let, let's hope we don't have to do it online again but I don't know, I'm probably being optimistic. I think we, we can consider the event finished. Thanks thanks once again, Renan, for, for this piece of knowledge that you shared. I think it was very, very interesting. We, uh, we well, in the society, we have been missing uh, experimental, uh, experimental discussions, mostly as this one, because, well, we are mostly focused on CFD, but as you very well explained, there is a, is a relation of, of of well of mutuality, no? so both things have to be taken into account into the into the industrial and research uh, uh, background. So thank you very much, and well, let's hope we can meet physically sometime instead of uh, instead of through the, the webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, thank you very much, you all. Uh, I hope this was kind of more a formal uh, talk. Just try to share as much as I could. Uh, 
I know that it can be quite helpful for students, especially if you're starting with CFD. So, uh, good luck, Sonia. It'll be a pleasure to be with you at some point, and uh, do us uh, another call. Thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Renan. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.